by cartoonist's room. Uh, is Michael Lunig around, please? Michael Lunig? Just a second, I'll see if he's around. Do you know where Michael is? No, I haven't seen him this morning. Is Michael around, do you know? Michael? Uh, no, haven't seen him for a few days. Do you know if Michael's around? No, I don't know where he is. Look, I'm terribly sorry, he seems to have disappeared. As a cartoonist, many of my ideas come from a personal dilemma. Most of my work is based on observations of city life, yet I've never regarded the city as my spiritual home. As an artist, I'm tied to the city, but at the same time, I'm always wanting to be out of it. If bewilderment was a crime, I'd be in big trouble. But then I regard bewilderment as a sane and proper response to life in a city. My newspaper work and my books seem to be inspired by the confusion people face in a crowded and lonely world. With so much bombarding us, it's hard to hold on to what's really important. And for me, one of the main things we're losing is our link with nature. This was all going through my head when I decided to go to Central Australia. I wanted to strengthen some of my feelings that were getting worn down in the city. The desert's always seemed like a place of purity and renewal, and it had always been a dream of mine to go there. Now I'd stumbled into doing it almost before I was ready. I wondered what I would find down there. I arrived in Alice Springs, the centre of the continent. I felt led astray and distracted. This wasn't what I'd come to see. It all seemed awfully familiar and somehow quite absurd. Alice Springs wasn't supposed to be any more than a telegraph station and a place to fill your water bottle. But something had gone very wrong. Here was a place so constantly being torn to bits and rebuilt. I had the feeling that one day it would all just disappear. Back in the city we imagine it. A man alone in a vast landscape, merging with distant horizons, and perhaps gaining new insights and visions. After all, that's one of the things desert has always stood for. I'd hoped for a new vision. Instead, I got Alice Springs on Australia Day. A happy Australia Day to you all. And welcome to Alice Springs' official flag raising ceremony. Somehow it seemed just a bit inappropriate. This was a culture that was out of place, but didn't seem to mind. I thought of Sturt the Explorer, 
140 years ago, he dragged a boat through the desert in search of a mythical inland sea. We didn't seem to have come far since then. Here we were, still dragging our baggage from the past. You could feel the heat pressing down. Just to keep the flag flying out here seemed a difficult and worthless struggle. Springs was somehow just a clumsy gesture in the stillness of the desert. I left Alice Springs. It wasn't one of life's hard decisions. Four hundred kilometers away at Ayers Rock, or Uluru, I started to get a glimpse of what I was after. A lot of my drawings seem to deal with scale, a small, frail human in a vast universe. There at Uluru, confronted with this huge, inexplicable form, I felt like a character from one of my drawings. Like most people, I made odd attempts at capturing this rock on little bits of paper. But of course, one of the great things about wild places is that they just can't be conveniently reduced to our scale. We're forced to ponder our own place in a much bigger scheme of things. Wiser people than me have grappled with all that. I found some wonderful Aboriginal paintings that go back thousands of years. They're hidden away in the rock's caves and some show ancestor spirits and events from the time of creation. For Aboriginal people, the stories from that time explain the formation of the land. I think the heat was starting to play pleasant little tricks on me there. I'd be pleased to think my pictures were as relevant to modern culture as these pictures are to the Aborigines. I wanted to find out more about the Aborigines, but as yet I didn't know how. I 
I reckon my attempts to capture the presence of this place were a dismal failure. However I tried to look at them, the rock's power just wasn't there. But stauncher hearts than mine had arrived to have a go. Rightio, folk, here we are at the Sunset Viewing Area, Ferrier's Rock. The idea of uh, capturing the mood of the rock on film is to take a series of photographs. If you just stare at it, uh, if it does change, if it's that gradual, you won't notice it. So have a look at it, turn away for a few seconds, have another look and go smash. I could see that the real wilderness would be harder to find than I'd thought. It was a lot bigger than we thought, I think. Oh, I was expecting fun. something that you, like you'd see in the States. Anything like this back home? No, no, no. What did you think when you saw it? I couldn't believe how, what is a rock this size doing in a place like this? <laughs> Where would you prefer to see this rock? Oh, this is fine. This is fine. <laughs> There's rock. So far, it's nice. I'm just waiting for the sunset so I can see it change color. I'm expecting to get bright red and purple and <laughs> all different kind of colors. I'm hoping it'll turn out like a tourist brochure. That's from pictures I've seen of it. That's what I'm hoping to see. There were obviously some high hopes, but that evening the rock and the sun refused to cooperate. I think the rock is weird. That's, that's my first impression. It's it's eerie. It's, um, there's something about it. I can keep looking at it and looking at it. And the more I look, the more I think about the thing. It, I'm not expecting to see any colors tonight with this um, cloud and sky and the rain over there, but um, it's, it's definitely eerie. I've got a queer, queer feeling about me all the time. So you're not too disappointed? Definitely. Not. Oh, no, no, no. I'm hoping tomorrow I'll see a, a much brighter day and a, a different rock altogether. But uh, tonight, I think it's, it's quite eerie. I've been accused at times of not having my feet firmly enough on the ground. I suppose I could think of a more suitable place to meet Dick Kimber. But if it had to be in a balloon, that seemed fair enough to me. I'd heard quite a bit about Dick. He's got a wonderful knowledge of Central Australia. Looks very gentle from up here, Dick. Yes, it's... Uh a bit of an illusion how gentle it is because we're seeing it after rains a bit and also I guess your deserts here are the unusual in world deserts in many ways. They've got so much vegetation that's so well adapted to it. Dick took me along the McDonnell Ranges. He flew over an area known to the Aborigines as Caterpillar Dreaming. We were talking about the old Aborigines and how they managed to sort of pulse with the country, I think. They, they moved with it, lived with it, whereas you look, read the old explorers' journals and they tried to fight it to get through. Of course, they were trying to get through, but they therefore tended not to look at the seasons particularly. They didn't understand the seasons, in fact. Uh, they didn't understand the country, and it's all natural enough. 
obviously a lot of hard stories associated with that country we're looking at now. And there's an account of one fellow who was down on a sand hill, climbing up this sand hill, he couldn't make it any further, sat down on the shade of the tree. If he got to the crest of the sand hill, he would have seen the homestead over the rise. Would have almost certainly made it because he could see it and get water. There's an old Henry Lawson poem which says, uh, the lost was found, we brought him round and took him from the place while the ants were swarming on the ground and the crows were saying grace. I really think that sums it up a bit for a lot of the people who came out here, but those who survived, that's what you've got, is the great survivors out in this country in many ways. It seemed amazing that humans could survive out there. It was vast and it was awesome. Dick told me about the Simpson Desert, a wilderness of sand and silence. Some of the dunes are about 30 metres high and the rainfall barely reaches four inches a year. The first recorded crossing of the desert wasn't until 1936 and to the Aborigines it contains places of death and evil spirits. This was a place to be respected. But there are a few hardy souls who live in the Simpson. At an isolated homestead, I met an old friend of Dick's. Romeo Hotel Yankee, 8 Romeo Hotel Yankee with a red sign. Molly Clark has lived out there for about 30 years. She surrounded herself with a world that reminded me of a distant, frail suburbia. But Molly herself was anything but frail. person that was going to sit down and let isolation get on top of me, this is where it would have happened in that first 18 months. It gets a bit rough when you get up in the morning and you've got to sweep the stove before you can put the kettle on. <laughs> My visit with Molly had the feeling of a sort of timeless interlude. We enjoyed talking about all kinds of little things. Is there a time of day when you, um, you know, you like to spend with your diary, writing in your diary? Usually at night, no. Yeah. Mm. Usually, sometimes I'll sit down at dinner time and might sort of scrape something in and then yeah. I just write it up at night before I go to bed. Yeah, that must be, um, there must be techniques. This must be a technique, I suppose, just for, you know, dealing with isolation, I guess. It's like anything living out here. You'd go stupid if you thought, oh, I can't go to the pictures and I can't get dressed up and go shopping and I can't do this and, that, and you'd let that eat away at you. Yeah. And you don't. I guess you must know a lot about you know, dealing with, with this thing, you know, which you call isolation. I mean, I guess it's like, it'd have to be like dealing with the heat, dealing with, all, with nature. There, there isn't isolation. Isolation is when I think when your mind is isolated from everything else, but if you're, if you're actively involved in the things around you, you're not isolated. I can see beauty in everything. I love the trees, the birds, the flowers, the colours. That's why I'm never bored. What? I like the challenge that it offers you. The challenge? Because I find that life in the city doesn't offer you a challenge at all. You just plough along with every other John, Dick and Harry, and life just goes on day after day after day. I don't find any challenge in living back in civilization. Birdsville, Molly, which, which direction from where we're sitting? Southeast. Southeast. Which is down across the. Yeah, how many miles? Oh, Michael, I'm not sure of the miles. It's, it's close to 400, but mm. there's 1,111 sand dunes. 1,111 sand dunes and 400 miles. <laughs> <laughs> it's a lot of dunes, isn't it? 
this harsh heat to dust. I mean, does this develop within people um, a sort of a hating of nature at times? Do you curse it? Do you... Well, yeah, lots of people do. That's what causes lots of people to try and work against it. But you don't get anywhere. You just then can not defeat nature. I have a very deep and healthy respect for it, I can tell you. I could see that Molly was really at peace out there. But at the same time, I thought I could sense another dimension to this country that she could tell me about. I felt I was getting closer to this country. It was my first real contact with the desert and it was a place to stir the imagination. The sand was full of mysterious tracks and markings. They brought back childhood notions of pixies and fairies. You close your eyes at night and everything springs to life. They were like drawings or hieroglyphics from a secret world. There was a power and a mystery out there. I realised more than ever that I had to find out about the Aborigines' relationship to all this. I knew Dick Kimber could help me. I was out in the great sandy desert about 400 miles west of Alice Springs with Timmy Plunkett Jabangati. He's a Pindaby man. We'd been trying to get back to his country over several years, tried five times and couldn't make it for various reasons, but finally got out there in September 1985. And it's uh, all just terrible sandhill country to any European, but that was his home to him. So we're travelling along over the sandhills and we finally came to a little outcrop of rock with a little water hole, dry as a bone. He looked at it, he just said, poor bugger. And then we went on again. We came to another little soakage water. Again, he said, poor bugger. And then we went along and we finally came to this rock hole, had a little bit of dried up mud at the bottom. He said, poor bugger, my country. And I said, uh, don't want to upset you, Timmy, but why'd you say that? He said, I haven't been looking after it. I've been away too long. I should have been here. I should have been singing the country. I should have sung the songs for it. I should have been burning it to make it 
grow nicely. The grass had come up again after the rain. And I think he's just very sad that he wasn't looking after it, how his grandparents had, how his father had, his mother had. So for him, poor bugger, my country. I was beginning to understand something that seems to me to be very important. It's the Aboriginal sense of guardianship of the land. Regardless of who's done most of the damage, they feel responsible for any destruction of their ancient heritage. Dick had put me onto Michael Nelson and Jack Duparula. Together we went out to their country, possum country. They said it was named after possums who travelled there in the dream time and turned themselves into hills. Despite the haziness of the days, the heat out there was intense. But I felt really privileged to be with people who had such a long connection with the country. Jack grew up here. Jack, you were a little boy in this country. Yeah. For me, and I've been walking around here a little bit. You would have been to this spot many times. So, yeah, yeah. Most of the possum hills are around us, you know. Yes. All these hills we see mm. are possum hills. You possum. are. Yeah. 13 years since you've you been are. here? Yeah. Yeah, yeah because mm. he, was, he was born here. Yeah. That's his first place. That's his dream. You know. That's the reason, you know, he, he was dead worrying about his country and now he's happy to see his country again. Talking with Jack and Michael, I became aware of stories and memories in sacred places. I could see there were very specific ways to interpret this land, and I felt I'd be a fool to just ignore them. Even though I couldn't see it exactly their way myself, the land had a meaning and a life of its own. This place. I discovered yeah. Michael was an artist and I was really keen to get some insight into his work. We are now. These paintings, Michael, that you do on canvas now, so these mm. were, once these were all sand paintings, all sand paintings. All they? sand painting and, uh, and body painting. On body painting? Yeah. yeah. And we do it in the shield. Yeah. Well, these possum paintings, you know, the yeah. dream ones, you know? I see. Yeah. And it all comes from this country. Oh, all of yeah. those things were first from, done yeah. of this country. And when I look at your paintings, I see this country, maybe. Good yeah, it was a sort of bright colour, light red. Yeah. You like this big canvas best? Yeah, I like. I like this canvas. Good big painting. I don't know if flies get stuck in the paint. No. <laughs> I'm only just worrying about grass. Yeah. Michael was quite happy to let me join in. Even though his work is very different to mine, I felt a connection with it. I reckon there's always some common ground between artists. I'm out of paint, I think, Michael. Oh, you want just, some paint? Yeah, yeah I know. I know. This is looking good. Yeah, it looks good, right? <laughs> this looks yeah. like this looks like some paintings you might see. Ah, city, yeah, yeah. you know, yeah. finished already. <laughs> Michael's one of the Western desert artists. They've distilled the essence of their country into something really inspiring. The 
The techniques are new, but the paintings are true to an ancient tradition. They may depict specific areas of land with circles representing significant places. In Aboriginal culture, features of the landscape are evidence of the dreaming. This was the time of creation when everything came into being. The paintings are connected to the stories and songs of the dreaming and they can show things like where the creators of the land have travelled or settled. They're a complex code that we can't fully understand, but for me they're clear proof of the vitality and resilience of Aboriginal culture and the importance of the land. Yeah, that's all for the day. You finish the painting for the Finish for the day, Michael. Yeah, finish the the, you finish the start. Yeah, for the start, really. <laughs> yeah, good. Good yeah, start. Yeah, round circle. Uh, getting the start's the hard bit, isn't yeah, it? Right. For me, it is. Yeah. Oh. And this this place here that you've painted here. This one of the main hill now. The main hill, yeah. yes. You know that time we climbed? Hmm, hmm. So you've got a big way to go yet. Yeah. A lot to go, yeah? Big mob. Big mob, yeah. yeah. I'd love to see this when it's finished. <laughs> seen the country, you know, your country with yeah, the hills. Yeah, yeah. When, I, when I look at my country, mm. where I was born, in Melbourne, yeah. instead of seeing hills, I will see things like this, you see. Big, Big tall buildings. <laughs> and maybe, you know, maybe this person mm. who is me, maybe I draw myself oh, in a Or oh, anyone, you know, from yeah. big cities. Anyone from big cities, yeah. that's right. Don't He's alone, know, and he looks very unhappy, you see. Oh, yeah. Just look here. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. And you so, feel sorry for yeah. this man, you think, <laughs> you know, this poor bugger. Uh, <laughs> He's, been, He's been working hard. Mm. Michael, you should have a little dog with that lonely man too. You should have a little dog, his friend. <laughs> what? With a little chain or rope. A little rope, who? Him holding it? Yeah, him holding Say it. Say I drew him like this, like with a pointy nose. Yeah. Eyes well, like oh, that. Oh, yeah, this like foxes. Yeah, a bit like a fox. <laughs> yeah. But he's happy dog. A uh, happy dog. How's that? Maybe he's having <laughs> a long... Oh, yeah. <laughs> Maybe the drawing makes me laugh. <laughs> <laughs> no I reckon everyone has their own sort of dreaming. I hope I don't sound presumptuous, but I think I'm trying to remind people of some fundamental things in my own small way. Our society seems to have lost so much of its meaning and dreams. That's why Aboriginal art excites me so much. It seems to give purpose and sense to everything around us. To Aboriginal people, this thing we call wilderness goes far beyond just being scenery. That's our first appreciation of the landscape. But you can go deeper than that. I 
I couldn't imagine Michael or Jack ever feeling alone out there. To them and their people, the land itself is a living thing. Maybe if we saw it that way too, we'd look after it a lot better. I thought back over what I'd experienced. I guess I was still my old self, bewildered and displaced as ever, but I was also fascinated and intrigued, and it's often then that things begin to gel. I felt I was starting to grow just a little. Some of all this in my work, results can take a long time, but something had begun. It was at night when the stillness really closed around me. That's when things started happening. Those nights in the desert were exciting and inspiring, but they also gave me an inkling of the peace I hadn't known before. What on earth is this thing? It's a uh, portable work station. It uh, lets us provide telephone circuits for uh, people in places where we can't get to them in the normal means. And uh, how does it function? I mean, that's pointing to OSAT's uh, second satellite uh, sitting in a geostationary orbit 37,000 kilometres up in that direction, exactly in that direction. It's pointing right at it. So anything that a, a telephone... I felt an awful sort of fascination but this just wasn't right. I'd gone from stories of possum dreaming to a sort of modern science dreaming. It brought me back to my world with a crunch. I realised I was tied to it and soon I'd have to go back. But here was my chance to send back a message from the centre. My own small token of the power of this place. It can, it can fax, so I could send a picture? Yes. Hmm. 
I think I'd like to do that. Every time I sit down to draw, I feel as though I'm starting at the beginning again. I wanted to send something back to the city, but I hadn't really planned anything. The drawing just started to emerge. You can only paint your own country in your own dreaming. But I couldn't help being affected by the strength of Michael Nelson's dreaming. But my drawing was more light-hearted. It shows the bewilderment of one traveller as he floats through a new landscape and encounters new ideas. His eyes grow wider. He's lost and confused but also a part of this new world in some way. Like this little traveller, I've been affected by my journey, and in some small way I can never be the same again. Sometimes we need to wander into the wilderness to grasp what's happening to us. We stumble along dreaming tracks of our own making, and in the heat, well, who knows, a clearer picture might emerge. Hello, cartoonist room. Michael Lenny? Uh, I'm not sure, mate. I haven't seen him around for a while. Hang on, I'll just check. Anyone seen Lenny? No. Uh, anyone heard from Lenny? No, not for ages. Michael Lenny, get there? No, don't know where he is. Uh, yeah, sorry, mate, but I can't find him. Nobody seems to have seen him for ages. Thank you. 